All right. Again, welcome. So this is the fossil fuel divestment uh, webinar, the panel session in the Earth Day Symposium 2022. Uh, a webinar setting means that we cannot see you uh, and we do have, just so we can keep focusing the conversation, we do have the chatting uh, disabled at the moment. And uh, you are encouraged to submit questions as the event progresses. Uh, as questions arise, you can just plug it in in the Q&A and we'll try to get to all, if not most of the questions. Uh, my name is Alini Gregorio. I am a professor of geography here at Fullerton College. I am the co-chair of the sustainability committee and I am part of a group of environmental advocates called the Environmental Scholars, FC Environmental Scholars. And we have been advocating for sustainability campus and district-wide and very happy to participate um, in the Earth Day Symposium. So this is the Divest and Decarbonize panel. It's a session dedicated to a call to action for sustainability, sustainability leaders in the California Community College system. It is the second and the last session of the 2022 Earth Day Symposium, which followed a wonderful keynote session on fossil fuel uh, divestment. If you didn't catch that, I will be following up with all of the attendees with a recording. I highly, highly encourage you to catch that recording. It was really, really inspiring and informative. It is really difficult for us to overstate the urgency for climate action. Earlier this month, the IPCC communicated the need for greenhouse gas emissions to peak by 2025 in order for us to keep the global warming within 1.5 degrees Celsius. Acting on this reality requires leaders to act swiftly and decisively to transition away from fossil fuels. We do hope that this panel is practical and provides a window of opportunity for our colleges to take part in solutions. In this panel, we gather here the Southern California Divestment Networks, uh, which is composed of community college sustainability leaders uh, mobilizing for climate action and highlighting fossil fuel divestment and decarbonization as key strategies. So we have a great group of folks here. I'm going to let them self-introduce and interact with you. And we will start here uh, with Andrew. And Andrew, before you introduce yourself, let me pose an overarching question to you. I think it is wonderful if our attendees can learn from you uh, as far as, you know, what is it that the community college system can do uh, to take part in the divestment movement? What, are, what is your take about the potential for the divestment movement within our context and how can folks get involved? So I'll pass the mic to you, Andrew. Great, so do you want me to introduce myself and speak to that right now briefly? Okay, my name's Andrew Walzer. I'm um, uh, instructor, professor of humanities at Los Angeles City College. And I'm a member of a group called Fossil Free California. And we're focusing, the, the organization focuses on divesting our pension funds from fossil fuels. And uh, our pensions, the CalSTRS and CalPERS have millions and millions of dollars invested in fossil fuels. And obviously that has enormous impact on frontline communities, on our environment, on climate change. And uh, so our focus is divestment of our pension funds. And what we need to do is organize our colleges, work through our unions and get them to support divestment and to put pressure on the CalSTRS board. So that's one thing we can do is speak up, organize the networks we have, our unions, to take a strong stand. Uh, the um, California um, CFT, California, Teachers Association has already taken a stand on uh, against fossil fuels in favor of fossil fuel divestment and chapters of CTA really need to get organized and start speaking up so that CTA takes a strong stand uh, uh, in favor of divestment. The second thing that's going on is that there is, we are promoting a bill um, in the state legislature, SB 1173, and that bill calls for um, divestment from fossil fuels, the pension fund divestment. 
and we've been so far successful. We've gotten it through uh, two different committees, the Judiciary Committee yesterday and the Retirement Committee the week before, and we have a lot of support and we're building momentum. And so you can join in that uh, fight to promote that bill. That's all for now. And if I can extend a little bit uh, of the question, what is how, how is your college taking part in this movement, Andrew? Okay, well, um, I'm at Los Angeles City College and we're part of the um, Los Angeles Community College District, which is one of the biggest community college districts in the country. And our union, faculty union, has taken a stand in um, favor of divestment from fossil fuels and our lobbyists are working along um, other folks to promote this bill. Um, the second thing that we're doing is we do have a sustainability, the uh, Sustainability Institute, Los Angeles Community College Sustainability Institute. We publish a, a twice a bi-monthly newsletter and we um, have published articles on divestment um, and um, we're promoting divestment and we we're having a forum in, um, on Friday um, focusing on sustainability issues and divestment. So it's about communicating with our colleagues and working together to mobilize folks, our communities to support divestment. Thank you, Andrew. And as a, as a follow up to that, let's connect with our political scientist here, James Stone, who can tell us a little bit more about the context of the divestment movement within higher education from uh, the perspective of his college and from his perspective. So James, uh, go ahead and share. Um, well, <clears throat> I'm not sure if you want me to get into my presentation at this point. Yeah. Um, okay, well, uh, let me go ahead and pull up uh, that. And I'll just uh, say uh, briefly by way of introduction that I'm a political scientist at Mount San Antonio College. I'm primarily a political theorist. And uh, so you might hear me uh, mention John Dewey at some point. And um, I'm also one of the uh, co-founders of the Sustainability Committee. And then what uh, was uh, founded secondarily, which was the Climate uh, Commitment Implementation Committee. And one of the uh, three, well, part of the team that worked on the Climate Action Plan that was ratified at Mount SAC in 2018. And uh, so those committees have uh, evolved into what we now have, which is the Climate Commitment and Environmental Justice Committee, uh, so named by our beloved uh, Mika Klein, who was uh, the champion of sustainability in our facilities department. And unfortunately, she uh, passed away um, way too early. Uh, she was only in her uh, early 50s uh, this past December. So uh, we're trying to carry on her legacy at Mount SAC because she was a great champion of sustainability. So, um, so with that introduction, let me go ahead and delve into, um, you know, basically uh, what I uh, think is the, uh, the trend that, you know, or uh, of legislation and uh, policies in higher education that we're able to build on. And so I think everybody uh, has heard of the, uh, of the bill AB 32, Assembly Bill 32, and that's the uh, Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006. And interestingly, that was really a bipartisan bill. So at that time, Governor, uh, Republican Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger signed it. He uh, you know, uh, was a genuine champion of uh, action on climate change, unlike most of his party and uh, a champion of sustainability. And that set a goal of cutting California greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels uh, by 2020. At that time, that would have been a 30% cut uh, from the levels that uh, were in effect at that, uh, the time the bill was passed. And then uh, to 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. And then subsequently the um, state Senate passed SB 350, so Senate Bill 350. And that was titled the Clean Energy and Pollution Reduction Act of 2015. And this set a, a three-part goal. So the first part was reducing greenhouse gas emissions to 40% below 1990 levels by 2030. And so you see really this, um, it's kind of a halfway point uh, between 
Um, you know, getting back to 1990 levels in 2020 and getting 80 percent below 1990 levels by 2050, I think, you know, you can uh, see that that's uh, pretty clear. And then another uh, part of that was increasing the use of renewable energy by California utilities from 33 uh, percent um, to 50 percent by 2030. So 33 percent in 2020 to 50 percent by 2030 and increasing energy efficiency in existing buildings by 50 percent by 2030. And uh, so SB 350 was a, a, a big bill. Um, environmentalists celebrated the passage of that uh, under Governor Jerry Brown, who signed it and uh, kind of submitted his legacy as, um, as a, a, an environmental governor. And uh, then uh, S S Senate Bill 100 was passed. And uh, so that was basically what the name implies. It was a bill that would have required California to achieve 100% clean energy um, by 2045. And uh, that bill was passed in 2018, as you see. So to move on you know, from state legislation, which is kind of the foundation for what we're doing in higher education to the policies and higher education itself, uh, which provides a bit more scaffolding for us as academics, so in May 2020, the University of California system announced that it had divested $900 million of fossil fuel uh, or from fossil fuel assets from its $126 billion investment portfolio. And that completed a total divestment from fossil fuels for the entire UC system. So that I think is um, maybe the most important uh, benchmark to mention. And uh, you know we um, have seen uh, uh, Jagdeep uh, Singh Baker, um, their chief investment officer, speak at the uh, Sacramento State Forum on Divestment uh, earlier this semester. And then on October 6, 2021, the California State University system announced that it would stop investing in fossil fuels, terminating its $155 million investment in um, fossil fuels, or um, it's, yeah, it's, uh, Part of uh, its uh, total fund, which is over $4 billion, uh, its investment in fossil fuels, and that included over $80 million in Chevron and Exxon holdings. And uh, I think that's important because they were kind of at the top of the list in terms of carbon dioxide emitters uh, that we saw from uh, Tom's presentation. And then with regard to the California Community College system, they have not uh, put in place any policy regarding divestment. Um, but they have adopted some climate related policies. And so I'm just going to be uh, very quick about that. Ira's going to talk maybe a bit more about these later. So by 2025, they've said that the um, triple C system will have reduced greenhouse gas emissions to 50% below 1990 levels. And then by 2030, it'll have reduced them by 75% below 1990 levels, that it will increase renewable energy consumption to um, 75% you know, of uh, total uh, electricity, the electricity component of the triple C system. And then by 2030, increase renewable energy consumption 100%. And then in 2025, 50% of fleet vehicles are uh, zero emission vehicles. And by 2030, 100% of fleet, fleet vehicles will be zero emission vehicles. And then 50% of all new buildings and major renovations will be constructed as zero net energy. And by 2030, that'll be 100% that'll be constructed as zero net um, energy. And then um, a term that more people may be familiar with, uh, by 2025, the pledge for the triple C system is that 50% of all new buildings and major renovations will achieve at least a leadership in energy and environmental design. That is a lead silver or equivalent rating. And by 2030, that will be 100% that will achieve a lead gold or equivalent rating. So uh, note you know, the increase in the uh, standard that they're being held to, and then increased procurement of sustainable products and services um, by 25% in 2025 and 50 in 2030, and then reduce municipal solid waste by 100% um, by 2025 and continue that in 2030. So let's move on then uh, to uh, the main point of what I'm really talking about, which is, because the triple C system doesn't have any divestment policy, the necessity for local action and lessons from the school that I teach at Mount San Antonio College. So when we um, 
drafted the climate action plan that's in effect now, and it was ratified in 2018. Um, so it was uh, approved unanimously by the President's Advisory Council um, in the spring semester of 2018. And then it was reported to the Board of Trustees uh, in that same semester in June. Um, it had a, an appendix, a recommendation on divestment. So basically it said divest from fossil fuels and put an uh, ESG investment policy in, in place, an environmental and social governance policy in place. So the administration, seeing that they took no action on divestment or creating an ESG investment policy um, this year, by this year, we saw that they hadn't done anything about that. The Climate Commitment and Environmental Justice Committee drafted and unanimously passed a divestment resolution. That resolution was subsequently introduced and unanimously passed by both the Academic Senate and Associated Students at Mount SAC. That's basically way, the way that we got um, Mount SAC's president, uh, Bill Scroggins, to sign the Climate Action Plan. He had initially pledged that he would do it in a public forum, but two years went by and he hadn't done it. And then uh, we passed twin resolutions through the Academic Senate and Associated Students, and then he did uh, sign it, and he sent out an email announcing that he had. So those twin resolutions passed by the Academic Senate and Associated Students were reported to the Board of Trustees, and then I uh, submitted uh, public comments supporting them from the CC and EJC, but to date, the Board of Trustees has not taken any action. Now, this is just an image of Mount Sac's new student center, which is currently under construction. Lead Gold, I believe. Um, Eric can uh, tell us maybe uh, if I'm right about that later on, but I'm pretty sure that that is correct. Um, so uh, mentioning Ira Baptawali, she is uh, Mount Sac's new sustainability director. It was an incredible hire on the part of the administration. We're so lucky to have her. Uh, she has taken the initiative to meet with the college's foundation director, Bill Lambert, about fossil fuel divestment and the development of an ESG investment policy in line with a recommendation in the Climate Action Plan. And she reports that that was an encouraging initial meeting uh, with um, Bill and that he has mentioned um, inviting members of the CC and EJC to possibly make a presentation to the company that handles Mount Sachs investments. Simultaneously, uh, or I should say subsequently, uh, CC and EJC members are going to present public comments at the next Board of Trustees meetings uh, on May 11th, encouraging the Board of Trustees to implement the divestment resolutions passed by the Academic Senate and Associated Students. And ideally, we want one representative from the Academic Senate or speaking on behalf of the Academic Senate, one from Associated Students, and uh, one from the Climate Commitment and the Environmental Justice Committee. And I'm planning on speaking uh, on behalf of the e, uh, CC and EJC myself. So basically my conclusion is um, pretty simple. Uh, it is that what has worked on, you know, on other things at Mount SAC is an inside outside strategy. So in other words, you have people who are working in you know, sort of a, a collegial fashion uh, with people in the administration urging them, you know, to uh, take, um, you know, aggressive action uh, to deal with climate change. And uh, so, you know, we've seen that work in the past with the uh, passage of the Climate Action Plan, with upping the standard for new buildings built on campus from uh, lead silver to lead gold and in other areas. And uh, so we think that it will ultimately work with uh, divestment. It's not good enough. We don't believe just to leave these conversations to take place behind closed doors. There needs to be some public component applying pressure uh, to the administration to take, um, take action from the grassroots um, and from the outside. So that's the reason for the public comments of the Board of Trustees. And you know, if that doesn't work, um, my thinking is we may uh, have more public comments by more people. This is what the uh, union did, the FA, at our school when the uh, administration tried to push faculty out of Kaiser Healthcare, health insurance and into a, an inferior health plan called CISC. Um, the acronym almost uh, is too on the nose. So uh, with that um, said, let me go ahead and conclude uh, on this note. Um, I think Charles Koch 
you know, was uh, bringing up the red herring that uh, renewable energy and green energy is a whole lot more expensive than fossil fuels. They're uneconomical forms of energy. And uh, he says, uh, in that case, if you force, um, you know, the transition to renewable energy, then the cure is worse than the disease. And uh, of course, we know uh, Charles Koch's role in funding climate disinformation. And we know, um, you know, about the link between fossil fuels and autocrats in Russia and Saudi Arabia and other parts of the world as well. And uh, so, you know, my conclusion is this is not complicated. There's no need to, you know, overthink it because we know what's at stake here. There is no planet B. So uh, thank you. And with that, I'm gonna stop my share. James, I really loved how you were able to connect, you know, the systemic and the grassroots, uh, because I often, when I discuss, uh, you know, action and climate action with my students, I always explain like the need for systemic change, right? And, and how you connected that there's policy and that policy happens through public pressure and public pressure happens through this mass mobilization that Andrew was describing, right? And how currently the, the California Community College system finds in its, itself in a vacuum where the UC system has moved, the Cal State ha have moved, right? And we really need to uh, follow um, and, and catch up so that we can facilitate that transition. So I really appreciate that connection. It was very clear. And actually transitions us perfectly to this history of mobilizations, right? In promoting change. So I will take this to our historian, uh, Josh, if you can introduce yourself and uh, talk to us. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Josh Ashen Miller. I'm a professor of history at Fullerton College, one of Alini's colleagues right across the hall. And um, I'm gonna, be a historian by telling a story. Um, I'm going to share my screen for a second. I, I brought one visual for today. Um, and I'm going to tell you the story behind this visual, which I think everyone can see now. Um, I made it as large as I could. So hopefully you can read this. This is a plaque that is on the campus of Occidental College. Um, for those of you who don't know, Occidental College is a small liberal arts college, about 2,000 students in Northeast Los Angeles. It happens to be the uh, place where my wife teaches economics. <laughs> so I've been on the campus several times. And uh, a few years ago, they put up this plaque uh, dedicated to uh, Barack Obama, who was a student there for his first two years of college. Uh, famously, of course, he transferred to Columbia and graduated from uh, Columbia University. But he spent his uh, first two years at Occidental. And um, <clears throat> I haven't fact checked this plaque, but they say this is his first ever public political speech. He was speaking at the main administrative building plaza in the center of campus in 1981 about divestment in South Africa. And I thought that uh, this is a, a parallel story to what we're talking about today, which is divestment in fossil fuel. Um, there are a lot of parallels. I'll stop my screen sharing now. We've all seen that. I'd be happy to email that photo to anybody who wants to have it, by the way. Um, South Africa in the 1980s was one of the leading exporters of diamonds, gold, chrome, manganese, platinum, vanadium, and vermiculite. Uh, a lot of those are important elements in making uh, steel. Uh, vermiculite is uh, very important uh, in the making of asbestos, so it's a little bit less important now, but diamonds and gold, of course, uh, made South Africa um, one of the fastest growing economies in Africa throughout the 20th century. Um, but by the 1980s, uh, glo the global civil rights movement had put the apartheid regime in its crosshairs. And they began campaigning for a divestment in South Africa. As South Africa, it was almost kind of a joke in the mid 20th century. Uh, people would say, uh, what's the latest advice from Wall Street? Buy Krugerrands. <laughs> Krugerrands were the, the South African currency. And it was such a fast growing economy that it was a good investment just to, just to buy some South, South African currency and put it in your bank account because it would, it, would, it would gain value over years because the economy was growing so fast. Um, so South Africa turned out to be uh, pretty exquisitely sensitive to global public opinion. And throughout the 1980s, because of activists on college campus, such as young Barack Obama, uh, but also thousands of other college students who were convincing their colleges and university systems to divest in the mining companies that had so much invested in South Africa, um, South Africa became something of a pariah nation in the 1980s. Uh, they were barred from international sports competitions, um, which I think in many ways was really uh, one of the most uh, consequential moves because 
uh, South Africa as a country is, is a sports mad country. They, they love their rugby. They love their football. Uh, they, were, they were very upset about being banned from these international competitions. But the, uh, the National Party, the, the white minority party that had ruled South Africa since 1910, um, felt the pressure in the 1980s. And uh, it was in 1991 and 1992 when President F.W. de Klerk began meeting with the African National Congress and, and Nelson Mandela. Um, there were steps to get Mandela freed from prison. And then in 1994, of course, South Africa had its first open parliamentary election where all parties were allowed to run. Uh, and Mandela was uh, elected the president as the result of that process. Um, you know, it's one of the massive historical changes that we all lived through. I think we can all remember where we were in 1994 when that happened. Um, and it's important to note that there were 13 years elapsed between Barack Obama giving that speech in 1981 uh, you know, when the divestment movement, movement was just picking up steam on college campuses across the United States and across the world, it was 13 years later that they got what they hoped for, that they got a, a real fair and, and democratic election happening in South Africa. So we're still in the early stages, I would say, of this divestment movement. Um, and I think the other parallel to make is that um, a lot of the arguments that were made in the 1980s against divestment, in other words, the arguments in favor of the status quo were the same arguments you hear today um, when you try to convince whether it's CalPERS, CalSTRS, or it's some other large asset manager um, that hey, we really should stop you know funding using you know our retirement money to fund fossil fuel companies. Um, the argument comes back as well, you know, we have a fiduciary responsibility. We, we have to we have to maximize return on investment for our our stockholders. Um, and I would, I would urge everyone here who's, who's joining this divestment movement to, to try to see through that argument for what it is. Because when they say maximize investment, they of course, they don't mean anything of the sort. They don't mean maximize investment. If you wanted to maximize the investment, you would take all of CalSTRS, take $400 billion to Las Vegas and, and, and go up to the blackjack table and see if you could turn that into $8 billion, or $800 billion you know, uh, with a lucky hand. Um, it's never about maximizing. There's always a balancing. There's always a balancing between risk and reward. And um, the, the, the purpose, I think, of the divestment movement, uh, part of the inside strategy, to borrow, uh, to borrow a word from, that James just used, part of the inside strategy that we have to undertake is to convince people that the risk and reward needs to be recalibrated. Um, that uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, maybe um, green energy, renewables, lead certified buildings seem too risky to be worth the investment. But that's increasingly less the case. And in fact, it's increasingly, increasingly looking more that like just on a purely financial level, uh, long-term investment in fossil fuels is much riskier than long-term investment in renewable energy. Um, and so that's, I think, where we have to really focus our arguments and, and focus, our, um, fo focus our movements. Um, to finish the story, uh, in 1994, uh, 13 years after Obama gave that speech, he was uh, a young attorney just out of law school uh, in, in private practice in Chicago, but also uh, a, uh, a professor at the University of Chicago Law School. Um, and it was just two years before he was considering uh, making a run for the Illinois State Senate, which uh, then turned into a run for the United States Senate. So um, I, wanted to, I wanted to give everyone here a sense of sometimes how, how, uh, how long it takes to accomplish these things, but that we do have a precedent here. Uh, and I think it's one worth building on and one worth reminding, reminding us, uh, reminding ourselves of, because I can remember at the beginning of this semester, um, all of my students wanted to talk about the Ukraine invasion. I mean, that was, that was the number thing that was, it was worrying them. Uh, they, were, they were wondering, how, how, how can the United States stop this war? Most of my students were not in favor of in, invading Ukraine, even if it meant to you know, stop the Russian army face to face. Um, and they asked me, well, they're talking about sanctions. Like, does that ever work? Do, do, do sanctions on countries ever work? And you can come up with plenty of times when it didn't seem to work uh, in the past. But I would argue that the sanctions on South Africa did work. The, 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 the global divestment in South Africa had a positive outcome. And it might have been messy, and it might not have gone as quickly as some people would have hoped. I, I bet that young Barack Obama in 1981 probably was hoping it would happen in 1984 before he was done with college. But it took until 1994. Uh, and I hope everyone is, is, is ready for a long haul. Uh, but also armed with the, the, the confidence that I think, I think that history is on our side on this one. And I, I think in the long run, we're going to prove that, that the, the, the risks and benefits need to be totally recalibrated um, to get us to a sustainable carbon-free economy. Thank you.
Thank you, Josh. And I, I thought I should add that Josh is not all talk. <laughs> that Josh has mobilized here at Florida College and helped draft a divestment resolution, which our United Faculty, uh, the Faculty Bargaining Unit, was able to adopt and channel it forward to show that UF is on board with divestment and we do want our pension funds uh, divested. So thank you for being a sustainability leader, Josh. It's, it's awesome to see you work, uh, you know, uh, persistently in our campus for sustainability. Uh, one of the questions that we also um, often hear, uh, Josh and I and all the folks in this room have been attending a lot of divestment uh, sessions, you know, uh, mobilizing for it at the state level in the community college and our respective campuses, a multi-scale effort. Uh, and one of the things that I, I keep hearing is, you know, how can shifting funds result in, you know, the reduction of consumption of fossil fuels, right? And this was covered in the keynote session, uh, but essentially it is one strategy. And that strategy alone does not suffice, and which means we have to rethink and also pair divestment with decarbonization. And sometimes what we don't realize is that our colleges, you know, we're, we're talking about gathering thousands of people uh, in a single space, right, per day. Uh, certainly now that we are returning to uh, more and more in-person instruction from the two years of, of the online instruction that we just faced, uh, returning that and turning back the power of our buildings, right? Turning back our waste management. Like there's so many uh, facets of returning to full-scale city size operations. And that's why sustainability planning at community colleges and universities is so extremely important. And why I'm so happy to introduce some sustainability directors that are taking part in minimizing uh, the greenhouse gas emissions in their respective campuses. So I'm going to start with you, Ferris, if you can introduce yourself and talk to us. Sure, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is uh, Ferris Kawar. I think everyone can see my screen now. Let me just uh, maximize it here. Does that look good? Um, I am the sustainability manager at SMC and I'll, I'll take you through a little bit of our history. We have a very rich history um, supporting sustainability. We've um, had a, actually an environmental center, which I work out of, um, dedicated uh, to over 26 years ago. And um, we've got my position actually was started over 12 years ago, and it was the very first sustainability manager across all the community college systems. Um, and it, it, that was significant. No one else had this. Everyone else, as many campuses uh, represented here even, just have had a you know dedicated faculty, and that's not right. We need um, people who can focus on these issues as their their whole job. Um, at the student government level, we have a student director of sustainability at our AS. Our president back in 2008 committed to being carbon neutral by 2050. We have committees that help um, support our goals and keep the ball moving forward. We have an environmental affairs committee that focuses on greening the curriculum across the board, a transportation task force that meets to find new creative ways to get more people out of their cars, an energy and utilities committee that looks at decarbonizing campus, reducing our, our carbon footprint. Um, and of course, we have to have guiding documents. We have a climate action plan that was developed in 2011 after um, we're doing an environmental audit, of course. You need to get a baseline, find out where you're at, what you need to work on. And uh, you can see from our first table of contents here that the um, that they didn't just look at electricity and natural gas. They're looking at all the different ways that we impact the environment from water use, energy, transportation, waste and recycling, purchasing, hazardous material use, food vendors, student engagement, and of course, curriculum. Um, and 
every year since then, we have been doing environmental audits um, to gauge how well are we doing, what do we need to work on, and we report that to an organization called Second Nature, and um, it's uh, an annual report that we do. It's similar to what Tyler is going to talk about, but he's going to talk about STARS, which is actually something that we want to do, and so I'm excited to hear more about what he has to say. Um, most recently, we actually had our board of trustees agree to pass a resolution that was um, offered up by the chancellor's office and um, Professor James Stone talked in depth about these goals, but it really was nice to see the, the, our board of trustees reaffirm our commitment to sustainability and put another line in the sand and say, let's try to meet these goals. Of course, they don't come with teeth, so we, you know, this is all voluntary stuff, but we we're, we're doing pretty well in many of the areas. And I'll talk about that in the, these slides here. Our green building practices have actually been um, pretty strong for quite a number of years in our bonds, which pay for all the replacement of all the aging buildings on campus. We're coming up on a hundred years um, and a lot of our buildings are being replaced. Well. We've committed to replacing those buildings as lead silver minimum. And we've been fortunate enough to, to achieve lead platinum with two buildings, gold with two, and silver with two. And that matters because it's not only saving us money by reducing our utility bills and water use, um, but it's healthier places to work for our staff, for students to learn. We spend a lot of time in these buildings and they do have a, a big impact and over a lot of time. So putting that extra money into green design really pays off. And generally, lead buildings only cost a, a, a one percent, you know, a, a three to five percent more in from the design stage than when you try to retrofit. So it's a lot cheaper to do it from the get-go, design it properly, and you'll get the maximum um, return on your investments. Um, across campus, we have a lot of great examples of um, uh, reducing our footprint from solar. We, um, across all the different buildings, we have almost 800 kilowatts of uh, sun that's being collected and turned into electricity. On our gym, which is a platinum rated building, we had the brilliant idea of taking the sun, heating water in solar thermal panels, and then using that water to um, for showers in the gym. So it was a uh, really smart move there. And we've done lighting retrofit projects. We've got a central plant on the main campus, which in essence chills water. And this, the bottom right corner shows you the big plant in the basement of our building. And it, it makes a big ice cube pretty much um, overnight. And then during the day, we use that cold to chill water that gets looped around campus and is used to chill all of the HVAC units instead of using CFCs, uh, which are you know, um, the, the chemicals used in um, air conditioning. And pretty much all air conditioning leaks and those uh, chemicals are thousands of times worse at creating greenhouse gases than carbon is. So it's an important, um, and, and it's a big cost saver to us as well. We've got energy management systems that have been deployed in all the new buildings, replaced boilers. And of course, all this stuff does cost money up front. And, um, but when done right, you can really have significant cost savings. As you can see in the red copy, I've, uh, we've estimated how much we're gonna save on solar, 27 million over the lifetime, um, lighting, six and a half million. So it really does make sense to do. Um, We've got a nice robust recycling and zero waste program. We have a dedicated uh, staff member who's a recycling specialist that runs our, our programs. They actually manage a, uh, eight students that have helped do recycling, do outreach, collect and sort materials. Um, we also have zero waste policies from our board that says at any large events, we need to have not just collection for trash and recycling, but also food waste. Uh, at one of our graduations, we had about 1,400 um, attendees, everyone graduating, having a party afterwards, lots of food and uh, beverages. 
at the end of the evening, 1,400 people, we had three pounds of trash. The rest was either composted or recycled. That's zero waste. That's what we can achieve when we make an effort and know what we're doing. We have water refill stations in every building to reduce single use plastics. We have had a composting program that is um, been going for 20 years where we have a 16 foot bin that's uh, behind the cafeteria. And that takes all of the food scraps from the prep kitchen in our vendors' um, uh, kitchens, and they take all that food, they feed it to 400,000 worms that live in this bin, and they, the worms eat through it and poop out fertilizer. This stuff is so incredibly nutrient rich. Our groundskeepers harvest it and use it all over our, our grounds as a fertilizer that gets our plants to grow nice and healthy, which means we get to reduce the amount of uh, pesticides or herbicides that we need to use. We don't have to buy as much fertilizer. It's what it's doing is closing that loop. We're, use, we're taking our waste, using it on campus for something that we would have bought anyway. So it's a beautiful system that shows um, that, you know, that's the circular economy that we need to get to. Um, at my office, I, I mentioned, we have uh, had this space for 26 years and it's the hub of sustainability. Everything happens here. Our meetings happen here, students meet here. Um, it's, we call it a campus as a living lab because it shows students how a office can be efficient and low impact. So we have about 14 workstations, lots of uh, students working there and staff, but we're um, zero net energy. We hardly use any water. We haven't used any natural gas in 12 years. Um, we are a zero waste office. Everything we do there is passive. The lighting is passive, heating, cooling is passive, water uh, retention is passive. And it shows students that you can, all the solutions that we face to the problems in our world have been on the shelves, have been accessible to us for decades. We just haven't known enough or bothered to make the right steps. And we try to show them that you've got this very good looking, I think, functional office that is um, a great place to work and you're not giving up anything. And uh, that's, that's really key to, for them to understand. Um, we uh, have four student um, clubs that uh, help outreach all of our sustainability. We've been going through Earth Week events of our own this week, and it's all run by students. Our uh, garden is also run by students, and it is a fantastic place for students to learn to be self-sufficient with their food production um, and uh, teaches them the you know, benefits of grown organic and in-season, locally sourced all that kind of stuff. And it's uh, amazing to see the transformation it has. Um, now, greening the curriculum, I think is the biggest impact that we have on our students because every student that comes through our halls is going out into the working world afterwards, whether directly through a certificate program or through a four year um, degree afterwards. But they, if they go into the working world without ever understanding that problems that we face and the better ways to do things, we're going to be repeating the same mistakes that we've made for decades. And so we have associate's degrees in sustainability or environmental science, environmental studies, and certificates in energy efficiency, solar, recycling, uh, non-credit certificates in, in sustainability. And many, many faculty have um, voluntarily woven sustainability into their curriculum, um, even in like psychology and history and classes that you aren't necessarily thought of as sustainable classes, but um, business and math classes. These, these professors are helping students connect what the, the world is facing to what they're learning. Um, and, and transportation, this definitely is one of the largest carbon impacts of any Campus. Generally, it's about 60 to 65% of our campus's um, uh, carbon impact. And we have worked hard to reduce that. And we've got about 70% of our students to not get to campus using their cars. Um, and that's done through, you know, we've got the, the deal with the big blue bus, and now it's with Metro. Everyone gets this. It's fantastic. 
we've got the, the you know light rail you know um uh, bike paths we've got uh we've been uh, designated a bike friendly university for several years um we've got a, a deal with the local co-op bike shop where students can go get their bikes fixed for free we over the pandemic we um, recognized that students weren't taking the bus they needed to still get around and they uh, we, we fixed up 115 used bikes and gave them to low-income students um, we've been uh, increasing our electric vehicle charging infrastructure um, and that's all important, and I'm proud of all of these efforts. And 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 I wonder, is it having enough of an impact? Is it just a drop in the bucket? Because I recently read that during the pandemic across the United States, the um, carbon emissions only went down by about six percent nationally. And this really reveals how fossil fuels are just baked into the economy. Just about everything runs on dirty energy, even though we all stop driving overnight, our lights, washing machines, our heat, the factories that make toilet paper and all these other necessities, they still got their energy from old dinosaur bones, right? This is because banks, pension funds and investment firms have been pouring funding into fossil fuels for decades, which has secured them as the default energy source because it's cheap and it's cheap because they don't factor in the full cost of burning that fuel. Those costs show up, as you guys know, in extreme droughts, wildfire storms, um, diseases like respiratory diseases, vector-borne diseases, asthma, um, and they're not paid for at the pump by the gallon or on our utility bills. Um, they've been successfully externalized onto society where we pay for them in taxes and healthcare. Um, and our colleges can only do so much with our limited budgets when the choices to do the right thing always cost more. Renewables need to become the default, easy, um, inexpensive choice, but this won't happen until the fossil fuel industry's access to cheap capital is reined in, and that can happen from divestment. I'm going to continue to push my campus to make better choices, but until we have the paradigm shift with change, which changes the balance of power away from fossil fuels um, to clean sources of energy, we won't have a chance of meeting the, the goals of staying within a one and a half degrees warming. Now, individual choices still do matter um, as, as much as the big choices. But um, so if people want to know what they can do, switch, look at your bank. What's it funding? You know, when you when you bank with a credit union or a small bank that, that commits to not um, funding fossil fuels, that makes a big difference. Um, if you're investing, where are those investments? Um, what are they, they funding? And don't just think all ESG um, funds are clean and fossil free because they're not. So just be careful. Um, get out of your car once in a while. Studies show that 30% of all of our trips made um, in a day, excuse me, are, are close enough to be made by walking or biking. So, you know, if you wanna do something for Ukraine, you know, try to get a third of your trips done uh, some other ways um, than your car. And if you're gonna buy a new car, make it an electric. If you're gonna buy new appliances, make them electric, whether it's your um, cooking range, water heater, HVAC, heat pump, all of these, you know, we want to electrify all of our homes and businesses because you can green the electric grid, but you can't green natural gas. Um, the other thing you can do is choose 100% renewable energy on your utility bills. It costs a little bit more, but not much, folks. It really is like two lattes a month. It's well worth it. And of course, vote. So thank you very much. That's the, uh, the end. Wow, thank you so much. So inspiring. Um, I must say that uh, mobilizing here at Fullerton College for sustainability, that Santa Monica and Mount Sac have been great examples. So when you ask the question, are we being impactful? I want to say yes. Uh, there have been many times that I was swooning over what Santa Monica is doing or Mount Sac is doing. And it's really inspiring change here at Fullerton College. And also, if I may add, you know, the idea when it comes to change, right, and to adopting individual scale change, 
I also want to recognize and, and have everyone recognize that we all have a different set of choices, right? There are different things that are feasible to us at different times in our lives, and uh, it is okay. And, and I think that, um, you know, the, the choice of what car we drive or the choice, there are so many things that we don't really have, many of us, many of us do not have a great control of, but there are things that you can do when you uh, begin to engage with like-minded people in learning and in the, the actions that you can take, right? So, so I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you so much. So let's hear uh, also from Mount Sac. So Ira. Thank you so much. And yeah, I'd like to just uh, also chime in and, and note what amazing accomplishments um, SMC has been able to share with us. I think they've always been inspirational to everybody in the higher education sector for sure. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. You can all see that okay? Okay, so first of all, thank you so much for having um, Mount Sac at today's session. It's nice to be here with you. My name is Ira Bhaktiwale. I'm the Director of Sustainability here at uh, Mount San Antonio College. We're also known as Mount Sac. <clears throat> but I co-lead sustainability efforts with my colleagues, Professor James Stone, whom you've already heard from today. He founded our Climate Commitment Environmental Justice Committee. And I also co-lead with Professor Tanya Anders, who is Sustainability Coordinator for Faculty here at Mount Sac. And together, we all sort of tackle uh, all things sustainability on campus as a collaborative effort. So it's a great working relationship, um, and they've become very good friends as well. Um, Professor James Stone has provided us with a very insightful view of divestment at the community college level and how we at Mount Sac are attempting to cultivate a conversation about divestment. <clears throat> what is clear to us is that divestment, it certainly means looking at things from a fiscal lens, but it also means looking at what we do in terms of every level of operation. To that end, uh, Mount Sac will be initiating a decarbonization planning process, which will provide us with a roadmap for how our college can phase out and off of fossil fuels um, and become a zero carbon campus. We'll be initiating that process this year. We're really excited about it as well. So I'd like to first give you a quick big picture view um, and then jump into what decarbonization planning is and then provide you with a view of how we can reimagine the campus in a decarbonized state. So first, the big picture. When it comes to decarbonization, there are really three skills of impact. What we can do at the global level, at the state level, and then on our individual campuses, in our case, Mount SAC. Um, at the global level, we've all become very familiar with uh, the UN's findings and their sixth report, which really calls out a code red for humanity. And they frame the challenge in terms of three main, very simplistic takeaways. One, there are 51 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions being emitted annually. Two, we have to stay at or below 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is a very tall order nonetheless. It's an order we have to strive to achieve for it to be able to get anywhere close to it. And three, we want to get to zero tons of greenhouse gas emissions. It seems like an impossible task, but there are already systems and policies at play that will help us achieve this. California has set a goal um, for carbon-free electricity by 2045, and there are various ways that we can get there. They're looking at various paths, all of which include um, how we can reduce carbon from our processes and our operations. At the California Community College level, um, James touched on this earlier, they now have issued their 2021 Climate Change and Sustainability Policy, which um, looks at various categories, ranging from greenhouse gas emissions to procurement to solid waste. At the campus level um, here at Mount Sac, we did our own climate action plan back in 2018, um, and it was also uh, facilitated by Second Nature. Um, we are now looking at uh, revising our climate action plan for 2023 and joining STARS in this year as well. Um, it was really our first attempt to grasp climate action at every level of what we do, from greenhouse gas emissions to building optimization to curriculum. 
But when it comes to decarbonization, it really requires us to go deeper into what drives our overall carbon footprint. Um, and that means truly understanding the composition of that carbon footprint in terms of the scopes that comprise it. So um, there are three scopes, as many of you might already know, um, but I wanted to give you just a very brief overview of it. In terms of scope one, that means any sort of direct emissions that occur as, as a result of on-site gas combustion, specifically on-site gas combustion. So hang on to that for a second. Scope two is another piece of the carbon footprint pie, and that uh, uh, means looking at indirect emissions caused by purchased electricity. And then scope three is sort of a catch-all. Um, it includes transportation, which is a biggie for us. We're a commuter campus for sure. Um, it also includes waste and any methane that is released as a result of landfill um, waste. It also looks at employee commuting. It looks at um, the end of life treatment of solid products and investments. So when we looked at our amount sat carbon footprint over these last few years, specifically 2018 to 2021, very interesting years, right? Of course, we saw a significant decrease in scope three emissions because of a decrease in commuting. We also saw a steady decrease in scope one and scope two emissions due to reduced energy consumption. Um, so that seems like we're on the right path and you know, maybe there are some lessons learned that we can then apply toward the future. However, when you then look at the same carbon footprints over these last few years through the lens of a greenhouse gas breakdown, that carbon footprint looks pretty different. You can see that uh, the majority of that bar graph is comprised of, C of carbon dioxide or CO2, um, but another chunk of that uh, bar graph is comprised of methane. So methane, though less in quantity in this case, poses a more significant threat as it's 28 times more potent, more toxic, more powerful than CO2. And methane primarily comes from landfill waste that off gases and from combustion of gas on site on our campus, from buildings by cars. So how in the world can we begin to curb our addiction to fossil fuels? And can we do this overnight? Can we cap it off tomorrow? Well, at Mount Sac, you know, it's really necessary for us to see the big picture and then phase in strategies that are most effective, that are well-funded and that are market ready. And coming off of gas reliance means, um, you know, really looking at a phased approach. So by 2025, what we aim to do is achieve a 25% reduction in emissions. Um, first looking at building optimization for sure. Um, and then looking at how we can electrify supplementing with renewables, upgrading our infrastructure for EVs, and looking at how we can first reduce landfill waste altogether um, by introducing zero waste strategies, and even looking at water conservation because a good deal of our energy on campus goes into pumping water around our enormous campus. By 2035, we wanna have a 50% reduction in, reduction in emissions, and that's really upgrading all of the phase one strategies, um, looking at renewable energy systems again, but also looking at how we can phase in battery storage systems so that we can rely less on dirty energy and the utility in general. It also means looking at reclaimed water systems um, as opposed to potable water systems because that's our liquid gold. And again, if we're able to pump that around locally, we might be able to save a little bit more energy. And then by 2050, we want to achieve 100% reduction, again, upgrading all of the phase two strategies previously mentioned, um, and really looking at EV in infrastructure and increasing our battery storage. And that's how we can foresee achieving this carbon neutral state by 2050 for our campus. So what does that new campus look like? How can we reimagine it? What does this decarbonized state actually materialize as? Well, in terms of energy, it looks at a myriad of strategies being spread across campus from solar panels to microgrids to battery storage to, um, you know, our big aspiration right now, looking at an integrated energy management system between all of our buildings that's smart and so that we can use the data and scrub it to make sure that we can find um, a reliable baseline to work from. It means looking at water strategies across our campus. Um, and how we can effectively pump that more efficiently, use that um, so that we can rely less on both water and energy simultaneously, both in terms of our irrigation and in terms of our potable water for our buildings. 
In terms of waste, it means first looking at how we can prevent waste from entering that waste stream across our campus, phasing out of plastics, relying more on reusables, um, and using on-site composting. We have a wonderful farm program. And so there are many opportunities here where you can optimize waste um, from going into the waste stream and reducing methane as a result. And transportation. So a myriad of strategies can be used here as well. Um, bike parking, um, but also EV infrastructure. Um, and we've introduced about 59 EV parking uh, stalls uh, with charge point just this past year that are free to all. We're really excited about that. In addition, uh, we have an on-site transit hub that's going to be coming online for use for anybody coming to campus and really anybody coming to this area. Um, that's going to greatly decrease our overall methane emissions for sure. And you know that hope is to arrive at this living lab on our campus from energy efficient buildings such as the new tech and health center that's going to go up or the new student center that's currently being constructed both achieve will hopefully achieve lead gold or lead platinum um, to smart transportation systems to carbon sequestration through our on-site habitat we're really proud of our sanctuary that's uh, available here on our campus and just this year we were able to initiate and commence our west parcel habitat mitigation project which is basically keeping uh, a piece of the land uh, for the life of the campus um, sacred and for uh, local flora, flora and fauna, and that's also going to help us sequester a good deal of carbon. In addition, we hope to become a Tree Campus USA. Uh, we are in Walnut, California, which is Tree City USA, and so becoming Tree Campus USA is not just a, a mission of ours in terms of certification, but it's an obligation that we hope to achieve so that we can help sequester carbon for our, our city as a whole. It's a commitment that we're making um, and it's a hope that we aspire to achieve um, so that we can become independent from fossil fuels and truly be committed to a sustainable decarbonized future. So that's my share for today. Happy to take questions later. Wow, so, so inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing. And again, these are spaces that aggregate thousands of people, right? So this is a substantial reduction in collective footprints. And it is super exciting to hear of all of these ideas. Here at Fullerton College, these efforts are new, but we do have a lot of momentum. Uh, our board of trustees, our chancellor, our president is very interested in sustainability. We have a sustainability committee and students are behind it and we have leadership to follow. So it's very exciting to see all of this path being set. And uh, we wanted to take a moment to talk about where Fullerton College is. And it is my pleasure to introduce our interim director of sustainability, Tyler. Tyler, tell us more. <laughs> Hi everybody. Uh, I'm first and foremost. Thank you both so much for um, your presentations on your colleges. I uh, I look a lot to both of you as examples of places we could take the college. Um, this is my first experience at a community college, so getting to learn the ropes here has been a few months in the making, and kind of seeing the politics and the world of community colleges has been enlightening as somebody who's only worked in uh, private before. Uh, so, like Alini said, I'm the Interim Director of Sustainability here at Fullerton. Uh, I came from the University of Laverne pre previously, uh, where I was the president of their Sustainability Club, which probably has the best name I've ever heard of any Sustainability Club, uh, SEEDS, Students Engaged in Environmental Discussion and Service, fantastic acronym. Um, and then I transitioned into a role as the Campus Sustainability Coordinator, where I worked on the STARS program and helped greenify Laverne a little bit uh, before I moved here. So, you know, as I think a, a lot of us are aware, right, you know, the global climate crisis kind of arrives faster and faster every day. And the goals that we've set for ourselves, you know, 2025, 2030, 2050, those are no longer far away years. And, you know, they come closer every single day. And we've set these goals for net zero and uh, decarbonization down to 50%, 75%, 100% in different aspects. And I think it's daunting for uh, institutions that haven't thought about how they're going to take their college in that direction. It's, it's daunting to come up with the solutions to get there, right? And 
uh, I think that it leaves colleges in a state of indecision over years where, you know, we're trying to figure out a course of action, but it's not necessarily, you know, in stone. And so, you know, I think the, the biggest, most time consuming thing is uh, collecting data about where the college already is, right? So I came here about eight months ago. This is a fairly new sustainability office. We've had a committee in the past and we've had good initiatives out of facilities and from capital planning that I've got that I can get into after this a little bit. But, you know, I, when I came in here asking very, uh, you know, we, we want to install solar. We want to do, you know, remove our footprint from the uh, electric grid and, you know, generate on site and become self-sufficient. Well, you know, how much do we use? You know, what buildings use what? And that data, you know, wasn't here initially. So I spent a lot of my initial months here kind of going in, getting the electric bills from um, accounts and just going through them, graphing them, charting them. Um, and I think that a really good framing for that is the STARS program, as Ferris was talking about earlier, right? So I kind of liken STARS, for those unfamiliar, to kind of the building lead system, where it's not exactly a requirement of, of any sort. It's more of a framework for which you can judge yourself against other um, campuses in terms of your sustainability efforts in the same way that your buildings are judged by a set of standards based on their, how green the building is, right? And so the STARS program it was kind of, is our college's initial jumping off point here. We're about 90% done with an initial report to be able to come by. I'm hoping by the, end of the, by the end of June, we should be able to submit. There's a few odds and ends to tie up still, as there always are. Um, but I've been talking to several most of the campuses uh, departments at this point and just kind of figuring out where the campus is. And that takes up a lot of time, right? And so I think that you have to kind of know where those emissions are coming from before you can decarbonize an institution. And I think that even if an institution doesn't have a climate action plan or, or plans to make a sustainability department for any of you that are on here that are looking for solutions to your college that you might not have a, you know, a direct plan for, I'd say the first step is data. I think da data has been a very core piece of my experience in sustainability. And if you want to create a climate action plan or decarbonize a campus, step one is putting those numbers together and keeping a record of them. And I think that's something that all all universities can do is have their departments compartmentalize the data and keep it all up to date month by month in terms of things like trash numbers, uh, electric bills, those types of utility things, as well as kind of recording, you know, every time you have some sustainability event, an Earth Day fair, something like that, mark that down and keep records of it, what, when it was, how long it was, numbers of attendees, things like that. Every little bit of data you can put together helps because then when you do come up with a climate action plan or start trying to plan one or bring a new sustainability manager into the university to try to do these kinds of things for you, they have a baseline to go off of. Um, it makes you know a difference in weeks, months, years of planning your initiatives, right? And so streamlining those types of things uh, is much easier with those baselines pre-established. So, you know, on top of that, when the, when we start moving forward with those, with those initiatives like solar, right, it gives your successes more weight in being able to compare it to things, right? So I'll give you an example and I've, I've come up with one little visual here. It's not much, but bear with me. The, so if you can, can you all see this graph? We good? Perfect. So this is a, a graph I threw together for, for this presentation of our year-over-year -year electric usage at Fullerton College, right? The numbers on the left represent the kilowatt hours. And you can see that for all of up until the pandemic, right as February is dipping into March there in 2019, 2020, month by month, we've pretty much been the same for the last five years, right? Before the pandemic. 
uh, but those numbers have dipped significantly. And we only keep our data as far back right now as 2015 at the district. So, you know, luckily we have four years of data for me to pull from, but I don't, I've been to institutions that don't have that kind of data reliancy uh, in terms of how much they've kept, right? And so if IO had to plan a solar panel installation, to keep giving that example, uh, for Fullerton, initially, if we only had the last three years of data, I wouldn't be able to come up with an idea of how much it would actually save us in real uh, before times numbers, right? Before the pandemic started, we had significantly higher numbers, as you can see here. Um, the numbers are starting to come back up. And I, with the on-campus coming out of hybrid, we're going to probably return to the same types of scenarios that we were at before. But it's one of those things where the, um, I, I think that the, uh, we're kind of, you know, we have to have those numbers for events like this in the future. You know, if there's anything like this again that, that affects things, you want to have a solid baseline is kind of where I'm going here. So to put it in context for what we're doing about it here. So like I said, we're a very new program, but uh, the, the North Orange County Community College District, which we are a part of, uh, recently passed a new administrative policy, 3580 for environmental sustainability, which was a huge win for us, where the district committed to sustainability goals on its own, um, within its own system, right? Which was drafted out of the STARS framework and plans to align itself with STARS' goals based on you know, all four of the criteria from you know, academics down to operations and all that. Uh, and it's gonna help all of the colleges in the district align themselves with the goals of each other and of the STARS framework. And um, a, you know, we'll, it'll allow us to establish a presence on the STARS network and give us good data collection because we're gonna start to work on these goals together, right? And so with the new policy in place, Fullerton College has started the path towards decarbonizing our campus there's been a lot of work here done already, like I mentioned before, thanks to the efforts of our sustainability committee and the dedicated facilities department here. Uh, we have water bottle refill stations in many of our buildings. We have LED lighting in 80% of campus already before I even got here. So the facilities department has been killing it. Um, vending machine occupancy sensors turn everything off automatically when there's people not nearby. The newest building that we just built, the new academic building 2400, was built with green construction principles, even if it's not LEED certified. And we have 15 EV or 50 EV charging ports on campus uh, on our West Campus uh, parking structure, which is fantastic. Moving forward from here, we're currently working on submetering the main campus uh, on facilities aside, which will let us break down our data a little bit more on our buildings. As At the moment, we have probably 70% of main campus on a single meter. So it's hard to break down individual buildings and come up with, you know, if I'm going to do a project in this building, how much is it going to save us? Because those numbers are harder to contextualize when everything's get aggregated. Um, but, you know, like I said, we have not had students using the campus during the COVID-19 pandemic. So with a data usage over the last two and a half years has been pretty skewed and predicting savings for future projects is difficult without relying on three-year-old data. So, you know, with the submetering initiative, we hope to move past into that post remote work world with better information than we had before it. Um, I see the pandemic as an opportunity for us to take our campuses low usage throughout it and try to figure out methods in which to maintain it coming out of that remote world where we can see where that excess load has gone and see where opportunities could be for change based on parts of the campus that didn't get much use, even as we start bringing students back in. Um, to start this process also, we've uh, I just recently completed an energy savings opportunity audit with the utilities companies, which gave us several dozen opportunity projects um, with I, you know, ideas on where to save money here and there, uh, including our HVAC, as well as boiler things, and um, just overall good ideas and opportunities, which we're moving forward with right now with the facilities department. 
we have a solar feasibility study that we just completed and it looks very positive from what I can tell so far. We're bringing that forward this week, in fact, on Friday to see how we want to approach based on the numbers, a solar installation potentially on campus to help you know, combat that grid reliance and become more self-sufficient. Um, but like I said, the, any of these goals, the, the, first start, the first step to all of this is collecting data. And you know, we plan to integrate these data collection practices into every part of our sustainability process, not just from a sustainability office perspective, but from the entire campus. I believe that sustainability works best when sustainability and data collection hand in hand both work best when you integrate those into as many parts of campus as possible that have their say in those things, um, whether that be in academics or events or purchasing. You want though you want everybody to be involved in the process. Too many times I've seen the sustainability office at campuses kind of be alienated into its own thing. Oh, they're going to do the work. Um, but it's really a grassroots work. It's, it's grassroots. It, you need the whole community to come together on it and kind of work, work forward and move the campus forward as a community. Um, I, I think Fullerton College has the heart and the mind based on the people that I've met here to really become its environmental leader moving forward into the future. And I really can't wait to see what we can achieve in the years to come. And I'll be looking forward to uh, continuing to rely on the rest of you for examples of where to go from here. So I appreciate it. Thank you, Tyler. I believe that too. And I must say that while it is like painstaking work, because a lot of the times when you start a, you know, a sustainability committee and you begin doing sustainability work, you have lots of folks like, where's my recycling bins, you know? And, it, and it's so much harder to start with, okay, first we need a policy, we need a framework, we need to uh, you know, have a commitment uh, to the sustainability principles that are defined national, nationally by the STARS framework that Tyler kept mentioning and hold ourselves accountable to that. Then start the data collection process to say where we are in comparison to how sustainability is defined, right? So it's, it, it is a lot, we, we, the sustainability committee has uh, done a lot of work and spent its three years, it has been three years since we started this work in laying this foundation. And now in that, you know, we are in the data collection process with Tyler and really looking forward to making some strong commitments. Um, but we are, we're running out of time here. So I have a proposal for the panel and the proposal is, if there is a question here, uh, we answered mo most of the questions in the chat, but if there's a question here, um, I would love to see, uh, you know, you just raise your hand and pick a question that you're really passionate about answering. Uh, so that, that would be great. So if there's anything that you see that have been answered, you can click on the answered questions. And if you wanna discuss, um, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll start uh, tackling that question. Uh, and I also, while you scan these questions, I really wanna thank our um, district leaders for attending the Earth Day Symposium. I see that Many of you attended the keynote session and attended this session. And I believe that that is the foundation of progress is to have open conversations, to learn about what others have done, to learn about success stories, right? So that we can get behind on good ideas together. So I really, really appreciate all of the students, you know, the, the, the leaders that we have in administration at the district level. It, it is so important that you're tuning in. So. I know all of us are appreciative of that. Um, anyone? So we have uh, uh, some questions here. As the ed educator in me, I'm going to reach out to the students. All right. So dear students, I see you very passionate about the future. Uh, and uh, I shared that with you. And I know that a lot of you want to get involved and you want to make change and you do not want to see these dire, you know, there's like so much climate anxiety, right? We do not want to see uh, our future materialize in the way that those scientists reports are continuously reaffirming. And I encourage you to organize. Uh, you know, individually, it is an overwhelming issue, and there are individual scale things that you can do, but what we can achieve together, right, 
like uh, what Andrew was talking about, uh, joining with uh, Fossil Free California, showing up at the right time when bills are being discussed, delivering a public comment, those things really do make a difference. And I encourage you, I'm a Rage Against the Machine fan, anyone else out there? Uh, and one of the things they said is, uh, don't turn away, get in front of it. There's a song that says that. And I truly believe that. I believe that sometimes things get tough and makes you wanna turn away, but we do need to get in front of it and take charge of our future. And I encourage you to get involved with associated students, uh, you know, found a, 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 find a club or start a club, right? And get connected. Andrew. Yeah, um, I want to speak to a question in the chat, which uh, or in the Q and A, which was how can individual board of trustees members um, support divestment? What actions can they take? It was by my former colleague on the board of trustees of Santa Monica College, Susan Amanoff. We'll give a shout out to if you're still there, Susan. Um, and um, one of the things that Ferris has planted the seed uh, in me is to get our foundations to divest. And it's true that the board of trustees doesn't have uh, control over foundation funds, but nonetheless, they can encourage the foundations to, uh, to have a conversation about divestment. And usually trustees are on good terms and in conversation with uh, foundation directors. And though, so that's something they can do um, either formally or casually is get foundations to discuss uh, divestment. So that's one thing. And um, another thing that trustees could do is have um, this conversation about divestment at the uh, statewide level at the community college trustee uh, conventions. And um, so maybe have a panel on this topic. So those are some things to think about. Ira? Yeah, um, I wanted to also uh, chime in regarding one of the questions from Nicholas, which was, what's the best way of getting the public involved in the processes? Um, regarding climate change and climate action. And here at Mount SAC, you know, we have an amazing um, student-led environmental group. They're known as EGLE, um, and that stands for Environmental Action Group for a Livable Earth. Um, so they are quite active on campus and are behind a lot of the Earth Week activities annually that we put on. Uh, we also have a lot of opportunities uh, within committee, committees on campus. So for example, within the Climate Justice Environmental, um, Climate Commitment Environmental Justice Committee, we have an environmental senator, we have uh, three members from EGLE. Um, so student voices are, are very much heard um, and it's very uh, faculty heavy as well. So um, it's a very collaborative um, conversational um, committee, but we still get things done. Um, and we have all voices heard. We also have the Landscape Advisory Task Force. Um, a student will be joining that uh, committee. We have the Tree Campus USA subcommittee. Um, a, the same student will be joining that effort. Um, I just think there's just so many opportunities on campus for people to get involved and be heard and make a positive impact in their own on their own campus. It's not always obvious, however. And so becoming more positive um, proactive rather in the conversation, asking how you can get involved, attending student senate meetings, talking to your professors, going to board meetings and doing public comment. I think becoming a very active citizen on campus is absolutely crucial to be not just involved in the conversation, but leading that conversation as well. And you have a follow-up question from our trustee, Aaron Lacordi. And uh, the question is, we are struggling here at Fullerton College with student engagement. Um, how, how have you been able, what are some of the strategies that you've been able to utilize at Mount SAC to keep students uh, engaged? Well, I would say, I mean, I'll certainly provide some examples. I think Santa Monica has a um, ton more examples than me in terms of student engagement, because I think that is what has been sort of a, that critical mass that SMC has is so, um, 
is such a model for everybody. At Mount SAC, uh, again, that, you know, that environmental group on campus is probably one of the most active ones out of all the clubs that we have on campus. Um, I am lucky in that I get to engage uh, across campus. And so I try to have conversations and have open dialogue with students whenever I have the opportunity. Um, having a strong connection to marketing is key. Um, we haven't found the very best way of communicating. I think we're just trying all the ways of communicating right now and getting the word out. So in my mind, nothing really beats in person. Um, so having in-person events is al always really great in a very high traffic area. Um, marketing out on our kiosk, on our social media platforms, on our website, having a strong sustainability website, um, and then um, really soliciting the efforts of students to help you promote an event is really key as well. Um, I'm curious to see what else Ferris has to share though. Oh gosh, um, you know, I, I agree with so much that you said, and I think um, I would add that going and doing class presentations, um, really, you know, getting invited in to talk to students and being able to show visually what, what your campus is doing or what you want to be doing um, and trying to recruit students in. I mean, really our students are so impactful. Um, I always tell them that they have more power than I do. Uh, you know, when I speak to administration or to facilities, to other departments, it's like, you know, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> There's Ferris again talking about something that's going to, you know, uh, cause me, you know, time and effort. But when a student comes with a good idea, they, they want to um, see something done on campus, everyone wants to see them succeed. They want to see them at least try something, even if they fail, because that's what they're there to do and, and learn. And so we've seen so many student-led initiatives become, um, you know, a, a, a garden, the compost bin, um, you know, so many of these things started with students saying, this is what we want. And um, they're still around uh, decades later. So um, I always tell students, yeah, don't discount your power to influence change on the campus. And so that means, you know, getting organized, having a student club, you need, um, you need advisors for that club, you have to find the right person, um, but also getting students involved um, and get them to go to the different meetings that happen on campus, like your um, you know, facilities planning meetings and, you know, all the, um, you know, the, the meetings where you're deciding what new vendor to have on campus, because then you can really help influence and ask those questions like, you know, do we really want to bring a fast food restaurant onto campus or do we want something that's healthy and offers vegan and vegetarian options, you know, things like that, that um, a lot of uh, people just aren't thinking of. Um, you know, it's been a struggle last couple of years um, getting um, people back. We're, we're having to rebuild all of our clubs from the ground up. And, but, uh, but yeah, so marketing, super important. Always hire, if you've got budget for one person, it's for me, it's a student who can um, do graphic design. <laughs> I think James has a question or something to comment. I was just going <clears> to... <throat> I was going to echo uh, everything that you and Ira said, but try to frame it a little bit theoretically in that um, I think like uh, John Dewey observed, if you just confine democracy to voting and representative democracy in the political sphere and every other sphere of people's lives, you know, where they go to work and uh, when they go to school is basically that it's structured in a very hierarchical model where there's, uh, you know, uh, somebody who's the boss and, you know, uh, is deciding, is making all the uh, important decisions, the, the decisions that have real impact, and they don't really have a role in that, then you have a very hollow democracy. And we have to, especially in this age where there's the threat of authoritarianism that seems to be on the march globally, we have to really start to take democracy seriously and reinvent it and make the connection between sustainability and democracy real for people. And, uh, you know, uh, that goes along with, you know, this idea of hands-on learning. 
you know, we're, we have to face the fact as academics that it may be that the pandemic has caused somewhat of a permanent shift to Zoom in the online world and to, and to attract students back into the classroom. We're going to have to reinvent education um, more than we have so far. I think acad academia has not been asleep. There have been people who have been thinking about hands-on learning, project-based learning. Um, but, you know, I never see students more in passion than when they have an opportunity to go visit Ferris's school. He's, you know, conducted sustainability tours for many of my environmental politics classes, or maybe go visit a real example of mixed-use development to see what that looks like in practice and not just learn about it from a textbook. You know, if you're just going to teach in PowerPoint slides and lectures, why would anybody come back to the classroom? So uh, yeah, this idea of the campus is a laboratory for democracy involving multiple stakeholders and uh, you know, students organizing themselves into committees and making their voice heard in, uh, on the important decisions like sustainability and faculty doing the same and then reinventing education to be democratic in content as well as in theory. Wow, thank you everyone. If I may just uh, uh, conclude here uh, following Jane's thoughts, uh, you know, that the campus space is so incredibly important. We often think of the classroom as a place where students make a leap of a generation. It certainly was for me. I was the first person to attend college. I did so as an English learner as an undocumented student. And I, I understood, you know, how I understand how education has transformed my life. But one of the things that sometimes we don't connect is how the campus space is also a geographical leap and how many students migrate from disadvantaged geographies into the campus space. And that space inspires solutions that they may not see in their neighborhoods. That space increases their access to important resources. For example, more than 1 million Californians do not have access to clean water, right? Here in Fullerton, South Fullerton, Fullerton has uh, polluted aquifers and polluted uh, water sources. Yet those students are coming to Fullerton College and having access to our hydration station, right? So I think that when we think of it that way, you know, it is, it is a geographical leap and that geography that we have in that tiny square in the map is a leap towards a completely different model of how we can do uh, urban planning and how we can nourish green spaces, shaded spaces, correct thermal inequities, correct food deserts, right? There's so much potential in how we do education uh, as a physical space. So I really appreciate this session. We are out of time. I want to thank all the guests. Uh, I will be sending the recording for everyone. You know, I, I know you're writing papers for me. So, uh, you know, hopefully this will provide a good review. And thank you the for, to the panelists. You've been amazing colleagues, a source of inspiration. And I really, really do appreciate your time for coming to Fullerton College and sharing your expertise and your passion. Uh, so we will end here and say goodbye to everyone. Thank you, thank you, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for organizing. Happy Earth Day. Yes, thank you. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Happy Earth Day, everybody. <laughs>